We have all clustering algorithms. It's probably the most well-known and popular clustering algorithm. It's called k-means. This is first off. This is what k-means does to that data set we just looked at. If you told it to find you six clusters, it's probably not what you had in mind when you looked at the data, but you shouldn't be surprised, and you're definitely not going to be surprised as soon as you know how k-means actually works. So let's dive in and explore that briefly. All right, k-means is really just a hill climbing algorithm to find a good Voronoi tiling of your space. You're going to start by throwing down k centroids. You're going to choose k yourself. You're going to assign each point uh, to belong to the centroid closest to it. That's going to give you one of these Voronoi tilings of the space. And then you're going to update that centroid to be the centroid of this new, that, uh, that new tile. And this is going to slowly shift your centers of mass around your space until you have found a good partitioning of your space. On real data, it's not super stable. Um, but on the bright side, it's super fast to do. Theoretically, there's some really nice uh, statistical analysis you can do under this and say this is just expectation maximization over a mixture of Gaussian distributions. And there's been some nice theory that underlies it, but it's got some really nice advantages. Unfortunately, I don't have a good TDA explanation for, for k-means. It, 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 it doesn't have a really nice interpretation. If anyone can think of a nice interpretation, I'll, I'll happily take it and start incorporating it. But even though it doesn't have a nice interpretation, it's a good place to start because it's what every other clustering algorithm under the sun is gonna get compared to. And there are some things that we can learn from the success of this algorithm. So first off, it's the grandmother of all clustering algorithms. Uh, so you know, so it's, it's led to the popularization of clustering throughout the ages to make so that good, a good baseline. It's incredibly easy to explain. I think I just explained it to the entire audience in less than 30 seconds. And I'm fairly confident that everyone here understands it fairly completely at this point in time. People really like using algorithms that they can understand for a couple of reasons. One, they just it, it, it's very pleasant to be able to understand everything that you're doing. But it also means if you fully understand an algorithm, it's less likely to break and behave strangely in odd situations. And that makes you more likely to trust the results of your algorithm, which is a super useful thing. Secondly, it's got lots of good theoretical work uh, in the statistical immunity explaining the theoretical foundations of the algorithm. Having a simple algorithm that's de with decently well understood theoretical foundations makes proving results about it really a lot more tractable. That's really appealing, especially sort of in academia. And again, it reinforces the trust that we're going to have in the algorithm that we're using. So last and definitely not least, because this is the thing that's given it staying power and legs throughout the ages, it's super efficient. It scales really well to huge amounts of data. And that's in no small part to decades of algorithmic research that have been done to optimize it. So it wasn't super fast out of the gate. People have been working with it and developing ways to make it go faster and faster down through the years. And that's great. There are lots of other algorithms that exist, but once you get to huge amounts of data, you start really limiting your choices for what algorithm you can use, and k-means starts looking very good out of the gate. All right, so that's why it gets used. How does it get used in practice? So it's hugely popular in the scientific literature. Um, 1.5 million papers making use of k-means across Google Scholar. Um, gets used in every field of science. Uh, not, not just in data science, not just in other things like that. Uh, it continues to get use in all fields to this day across the scientific community. Uh, here's a paper from what, 2021 using k-means to understand the current coronavirus. Um, super practical, super relevant, still relevant to the day. So I'm going to take a slight tangent diversion. Uh, this was inspired by Robert Grist's talk earlier in the week. K-means even gets used under the hood in places you might not expect it to be used. Uh, earlier in this week, Robert talked about examining graph Laplacians through a TDA perspective. I, I really enjoyed that talk because I spent a chunk of my early career working with graph algorithms. And so it was really nice to see all of the links being built. Uh, this paper uh, by von Luxburg on spectral clustering is a great overview of using graph Laplacians and exploring their relationships um, 
with a, both spectral embedding, which is uh, eigen decompositions of those, those Laplacian matrices, and with clustering. I highly recommend it, both from a theoretical and practical perspective. I think it would be really fun to roll through this with a TDA lens on and see what uh, results were obvious or weren't obvious or might be easily extensible. Either way, it's a bit of a digression, but spectral clustering at its heart is really just, I take a graph Laplacian, I reduce it into a lower dimensional space with matrix factorization, uh, singular value decomposition or PCA. I look at that low dimensional representation and then I run k-means on it and I'm done. You could in theory swap out lots of the pieces there, but by default, the clustering algorithm at the end of the day is k-means. And those are for all the reasons I previously mentioned. It's fast, efficient, and it makes proving theoretical results about the whole chain a lot more tractable. All right, how does it fail? We spent a few minutes talking about uh, why it was good and successful. We're going to talk a, few, a little bit about the problems of the algorithm, but that's going to lead us to the space where we're going to talk about sort of more conducive to working with topological data analysis. First off, uh, clusters are rarely large spherical blobs, even high dimensional spherical blobs floating in some ambient space. This is the Gaussian ball assumption underneath k-means, uh, which gets used in all of the theoretical statistical proofs uh, about k-means. So this is the kind of data k-means was designed to work well on, and this is where the theory holds out really nicely, and that's great. In practice, real data has topological structure. Real data has some amounts of topological structure, even if it's as simple a topological structure as we see here. To that extent, k-means will always give you an answer, but it may not be a particularly useful answer. And so following up and validating the, the results of any clustering algorithm is a thing that the literature is often a little bit bad on doing. And uh, it's something that's quite important that you should do because you can see results like this uh, that don't make a whole lot of sense. All right, the next big failing that k-means has is clustering and partitioning often get used interchangeably in the literature and they don't mean the same thing. Um, and that's so the partitioning, every data point has to get allocated to a partition. Um, with clustering, you don't necessarily need to make that assumption. And in many cases where you have noise and noisy data, that assumption can be quite detrimental. Real data has noise and folding that noise into nearby clusters is a recipe for creating heterogeneous clusters, which degrade your performance when used on any real world task that you encounter when dealing with real noise. All right, the last big problem that k-means clustering has and many, many, many other clustering algorithms are gonna have is how do you pick that k? This is the old standard of parameter selection because clustering is an inherently an unsupervised task, picking the right number of clusters ahead of time is super hard to do, especially if you're in high dimensions and you can't just look at your data. If you can't visualize it, how do you know if there are 30 clusters or 3000 clusters within your data? In practice, because people have to do something, uh, that's typically done by coming up with some sort of heuristic measure of goodness of clustering. And then you sweep across all your values of K and you plot to see how well that clustering is doing according to your new heuristic measure. And then you say, oh, look, it's maximized at, let's say in this case, two or for some measures or five or six for different measures. And you say, well, that's close enough. I'm gonna call it six and I'm gonna move on. So this works for standard measures, very simple data and for a loose definition of the word works. When you pivot up, to slightly more complex data, and this is only slightly more complex data, applying these scores to it often lead to very questionable results that really don't tell you a lot of what, what's going on. So they, these kinds of things tend to break very quickly and very easily and not be robust to real world data. All right, that parameter prop selection problem in particular leads us to the next big advance in clustering. So this was in the form of hierarchical agglomerative clustering in general, but I'm gonna focus on single linkage clustering in specific. And so I guess this little section, we're gonna talk about single linkage clustering in the age of bell bottoms. So everyone needs to go change into your 70s wear and then we'll 
move forward with this set of algorithms. So here's what single linkage clustering does on almost our previous set of data. So we had to exclude all of the noise from this data set because single linkage clustering is super, super sensitive to noise. And if we had kept the noise in, we would have gotten nonsense out as a result. So that'll come up again in the weakness section, but it, it shows up here because I had to cheat in order to make the data look good. All right, how does it work? So this is why it's really nice to talk to a, a room of topologists. You're like, oh, define single linkage clustering. Oh, it's uh, connect components of H naught of the torus rips complex for a given distance delta. And every topologist in the room goes, oh yeah, that's really obvious. You should totally do that. That's great. So now you understand single linkage clustering. Um, you might want to say, but that's not hierarchical. Didn't you say something about hierarchical algorithms? And you're right. And we're going to solve that problem in a really sensible way if you've got a topological hat on. And then we're just going to persist over those deltas. And so that, for that, we're going to construct a minimal spanning tree across your metric space. Then we're going to walk up and sort of persist up through that, cutting edges in, uh, in sorted order. And this is the minimal spanning tree for a data set. That's going to form a natural hierarchy of connected components. And so this is, you can see each of those lines is one of your uh, connected components and it splits and splits and splits as you cut more and more of your edges. And traditionally you're gonna present this hierarchical dendrogram they end up getting called to a user and allow them to choose a cut point. But really what they're doing is they're saying, I'm gonna show you how your data splits up across your space. And then I'm gonna ask you to implicitly perform persistence on this and find the natural or persistent clusters by I. Then you choose a cut line, which is a distance or it's delta if you're in your Vitoris Rips complex. It's gonna cut and give you a flat clustering of your space and you're done. And that results in this kind of a labeling for that particular data set. So every point gets assigned to the ID of its connected component and the algorithm's finished. So, I mentioned hierarchical clustering more broadly initially, and that's because single linkage clustering has a couple of popular cousins. Uh, complete linkage and average linkage clustering are the ones most often used in practice. Complete linkage is great. It's just the facets of the Vitoris rips complex instead of the connected components. And this has the result uh, that you would sort of expect of turning your clusters from those long spindly clusters that a single linkage clustering is gonna find into these big balls. And so we get back to those Gaussian ball uh, shaped clusters that we were finding with k-means early on, but we've got the nice advantage of having a hierarchy constructed across them, so you can still play those persistent games in order to choose the k. Um, that became quite popular for a while on very small data sets. Unfortunately, it's quite expensive to do, so k-means still uh, got used quite a lot in practice. All right, average linkage cluster lives somewhere between those two algorithms. It's harder to sort of think about with the TDA lens. In practice, it results in very similar cluster structures to uh, complete linkage though. All right, how did it improve with the state of the art? Single linkage clustering does a really good job of addressing a couple of our earlier concerns with k-means. So <laughs> it, it does a nice job on the clusters aren't Gaussian balls. It captures some topological structure, a little bit of the topological structure which is contained in your data, which is really, really nice and the thing that led to its success it was very popular in that it managed to deal with real shaped data. Secondly, it uses a hierarchical structure and persistence to mitigate the difficulty of selecting the number of clusters within our data, which is great. So how does it actually get used in practice? All right, it gets used in every single cluster map ever. So Cluster maps are a really popular data visualization technique that show up in data science. This is just a way to look at a matrix. So if you think of a matrix and I'm gonna color each of the cells with an intensity based on the value of the entry within uh, that cell of the matrix, that's gonna give me a heat map or a spy plot, depending on who you're talking to of the matrix. And if I do this normally, it's gonna look like an old fashioned black and white TV when you've broken your antenna if anyone's old enough to remember those. It's just white and black static across your screen. You don't see any structure or patterns in it. A natural or nice thing to do with that 
is that we're going to cluster the rows and columns of the matrix independently with a distance measure that are typically L1, L2, or correlation distance. And then we're going to reorder the rows and columns based on these dendrograms, which you can see sort of happening um, on the rows and the columns here. And that lets natural structure pop out of your matrix and it's an easy way to visualize things. So this is one of those really nice cases where we properly need a partitioning algorithm instead of that generic clustering algorithm because you need a complete ordering on your rows and columns. All right, so single linkage was significantly slower than k-means, but you'll notice that a huge proportion of the literature ends up using it for reordering these matrices for visualization. So visualizations inherently limit the size of the data that have, you have to deal with. And as such, speed becomes way less relevant for a lot of the practical use cases that people really use this for in practice. So I found a niche. Again, the algorithm can cease to, continues to see heavy use to this day. There's an example from uh, what 2021 COVID literature where it's practically being used to do analysis on the recent pandemic. Uh, it's been around nearly as long as k-means uh, and has still managed to accrue quite a decent number of usages across the scientific literature. So super popular. How does it fail? Scaling. So as I've alluded to earlier, the hierarchical algorithms are all significantly slower compared to k-means and that prevents them from simply replacing k-means. They didn't dominate k-means out of the gate they carved out a particular niche in the area of science and clustering. They've gotten a lot faster over the decades, which is good, uh, but k-means has also gotten a lot faster over the decades, so they've managed to only hold on to their niche as opposed to ever take over and replace k-means. Uh, they still have the same problem with k-means uh, when you're dealing with clustering versus partitioning. As we saw earlier, that can be an advantage in some, some uh, niche cases, but it's not always one. All right. That said, the single biggest problem with single linkage clustering is that it's incredibly sensitive to outliers. Um, throw in a little background noise and the results become completely unstable and you end up getting garbage out very, very quickly. Which brings us forward to the 90s. Uh, we've replaced our um, bell bottoms with, I don't know, acid wash jeans and now we're going to tackle the problem of background noise and data partitioning. And so this is a little clustering algorithm called dbscan, which took up popularity around then. All right. So here are the results of the best dbscan run I could create on test data. You'll notice that some of the points are gray, and those are the points that haven't been assigned to a cluster. We're not perfect on our resolution, but it still feels like things are starting to come together for us. How does this actually work? Once again, topological language makes the algorithm really, really easy to describe. It's the connecting components of a degree rips complex over a particular choice of degree and distance, uh, K and, and epsilon. And so the intuition here is that, and this is D stands for density, uh, that the number of points with a dense points with an epsilon ball of any given point is a really good proxy for density. And so what we're going to be looking, trying to do sort of implicitly is look for single linkage clustering across these dense regions of points. And so what's that look like in practice? You've, here's a quick little example where I have drawn edges, uh, which are the Vitoris rips complex. So you've got these epsilon balls around your data. The red points are your degree rips complex because they have a degree at least two with other points which are dense. And so you get the red points at the center being that lovely degree rips complex, everything else ends up being in the background. So of course, originally dbscan wasn't defined this way. It came out of the computer science literature. It was designed perfect, purely algorithmically uh, and tested to do really well on real data. Uh, originally in the original paper, those yellow points were included in the clusters. Those were called border points. Uh, they don't meet our TDA definition uh, and Soon out, these are points that are connected via the Vitoris rips complex, but not the degree rips complex, and they got called border points. Soon after, people became quite disillusioned with including these because it turns out that they introduce indeterminacy into the algorithm. And so the order you processed your data uh, altered which points were included and how they were included, which isn't a property you want anyways. 
And so they ended up getting filtered out of future releases of, of DBSCAN, which is good. And the interesting tidbit is it's very straightforward as soon as you express this from a topological lens that that's what you want to be doing. And so again, the topological theory provided good insight on what worked out to be useful in practice. Uh, 2020 vision, of course, hindsight, all of that. All right, how does it improve on the state of the art? So this notion of density allowed us to filter out a large number of those edges out of, out of our complex. And this allows us to treat those isolated vertices as background noise. So we've moved away from this concept of partitioning and now we're into a nice concept of clustering, which is again, quite useful in practice. This also makes it super robust to outliers, which is that other big problem we had with single linkage clustering. So we get to take the outliers. If you throw in a scattering of points off in the distance, far away from your individual clusters, they get relegated to background noise and don't have any impact on that degree rips co uh, component. They don't have any impact on your actual clusters. All right, how does it get used in practice? It's a more recent technique still widely used, sort of 42,000 uses across scientific literature, and it's much more recent. In fact, the original paper has got a ridiculously good citation count. Um, and so that's, that's not just general usage, but uses where people remember to cite the original paper, which is pretty darn impressive. The algorithm is being reused across a diverse range of applications. Not surprisingly, again, it's being used on COVID-19 in very recent papers. This is a a fun way to find out what people are still finding useful and relevant is what they hit real world problems that really matter today with as an algorithm. All right, how does it fail? It's a pretty impressive algorithm. Uh, it's a nice practical investment, but there are still a few problems. One big problem is that density is poorly defined for high dimensional data. This often in data science gets called uh, the curse of dimensionality. All right, the main point here is that as dimensionality gets larger and larger, and we're talking thousands and tens of thousands, our data points end up getting scattered towards the corners of our space. And our distances all start converging to the same value. So everything ends up getting roughly the same distance apart. And so a nice way to think of that is if uh, I'm throwing down points in space and as my space gets bigger and bigger, to end up on a corner or an edge of this space, I really only have to hit one maximal value on one of those sort of die rolls of where I'm gonna lie. And as soon as I've hit one of those, I'm on a corner of my space. And so the more of these axes I throw down under certain distribution assumptions about your data, the more likely it is I'm gonna, it's gonna be scattered off to one of my corners. That makes the notion of density really hard to do. You could think if you normalize those distances back down to be on some sort of uh, constant scale, that squishes all of those, those very high distances down to very small values. And so if you were to do things like um, uh, the torus rips complex across this, you end up having nothing connected, nothing connected, nothing connected, and then bam, you get a fully connected uh, graph very, very quickly, which is mm, not what you really want to be doing in high dimensional data. Second big problem was parameter selection. So we no longer have to choose the number of clusters K, which is great, but you just replace that parameter with another parameter, which was that epsilon, the size of your balls. The parameter is in fact less intuitive. It's harder to select than the number of clusters was in fact. Um, here's a couple of snapshots I built while searching through the space of epsilon parameters to find that fairly nice picture I showed you earlier. For a small value of epsilons, you get lots and lots of clusters with lots of points declared as background noise. You increase that a little bit and you start uh, merging clusters together and they start accumulating background noise and you're pulling them into your complex. This is, still isn't quite right, so you nudge it up again and you get too big. And so you've merged too many things and now you've got a big mass cluster. So you can iterate through and you could try to find these things that's hard to do. It's especially hard to do if you can't visualize the data and apply the advanced eyeball exam that we've all been doing so far. If you just say, I've got high dimensional data and I want to find my clusters. Epsilon or the, it can be really, really hard to search over. All right. And that, that last thing and it's just sort of tied into that parameter selection is, is we really lost that wonderful notion of persistence from the single linkage clustering. Um, 
and we really like to bring it back. And we can do that, right? So, because with the natural thing to do here, you're probably all saying, well, we persisted over that before. Why don't we just persist over it again in this DB scan and look at that, that hierarchy? And, and we can, and, and you're right. That's a really natural and the correct thing to do. We have to enter the 2010s, which is what uh, acid wash genes get switched for skinny genes now, maybe in the 2010s, either way. HDB scan is an algorithm that reintroduces this notion of persistence, um, the hierarchical agglomerate clustering or single linkage clustering brought to the table, but does it over top of uh, DB scan. So this is the clustering that HDB scan very naturally brings to you on this particular data set. And it's finally a result that I'm fairly happy with on my toy data. And so I'm, I'm quite comfortable like, all right, HTB scan, it, it passes my minimum bar for dealing with real world noisy data. Will it always work on your data? Not necessarily, but at least it worked on my toy example. And, and that brings me some joy. How does it work? So at its heart, we're really just building that degree rips complex for a fixed degree K, persisting over that distance parameter epsilon that allows us to build this sort of dendrogram in a similar fashion that we did the single linkage clustering. And right now we can play that same game and threshold and say, hey, I'm gonna hand this to you and let you by eye do persistence across this and choose your cut point and we can walk away. The problem is algorithms are getting faster now and we're starting to use this in more and more diverse cases on larger and larger amounts of data. And this visualization and these dendrograms don't scale very well to huge amounts of data. You start looking like a, this almost looks like a spaghetti plot as it stands, getting much larger than this and you've just got a big mass of a black triangle on your screen and that's all you can see. So we get to introduce, um, oh, sorry. I'll get to that in a second. The thing I just described is not nearly fast enough to run on real data in practice, um, but it's useful conceptually. In practice, you have to do a whole lot of trips to, tricks to make this really efficient. Uh, we've done them, you can read them in our 2017 paper and look at description of what we actually did, but it's all coded up in Python and sklearn and you can just import the functions and use them in, in reality. If you're popping the hood underneath your own clustering algorithm and wanna to talk to us about how to make it fast and efficient, we can chat about do, ways to do that later if you'd like. All right, but now punting on that persistence problem, uh, isn't a great solution. So instead, we're gonna look at some literature that came around in the uh, 2000s, 2010 area, was looking at these concept of condensed trees. So we're gonna add one extra parameter, which is the minimum number of points you need in order to be considered a real split. So dendrograms are really walking through a minimal spanning tree and cutting edges, and then connected components are falling apart. And that's what you were looking at ahead of time. And most of those, those cuts drop off a single edge or a single, or a single vertex or a small component of size one or two. And this just says, oh, well, if I say you need to cut off 10 components, vertices in order to be considered a real cut, that can prune that dendrogram tree back massively and result in a simplified cluster tree that you're looking at here. And so this is um, the, same, the same parameter value on the side. The width and color of each of these bars is the size of the cluster, the size of the connected component. And uh, you can see them sort of tapering off and getting smaller. And splits only occur when you've really cut into two significant connecting components, connected components of size greater than five. And so we get a nice condensed tree. And now we just say, oh, now I can talk about persistence really naturally across these. And say, so I want to select the set of clusters that are large and persist across a wide range of my particular values. And so we do that, and that gives you a very natural cluster selection out of one of these trees. You could come up with different notions of persistence if you want. Very easily, you could in fact look at this thing and say, no, no, I want the leaves of that tree instead of uh, the most persistent clusters, because I really care about small homogeneous uh, clusters of data. Those are all entirely reasonable things to do. You get one really nice, thing for free out of trying to do these notions of find me the most persistent clusters instead of finding me the flat cut in these in that you're allowed to do variable height cuts. And so this is like taking different sized epsilon balls in different regions of your space 
depending on how dense your data is locally in those regions of the space. And so you could do sort of variable height per, uh, persistence, which is a really nice property that falls out of this kind of a technique for free. And again, this is super similar to what? Uh, persistent H naught over epsilon for a degree rips complex with a fixed degree K. At the end, you have to do sort of special handling of that merge tree to get the flat clustering out, but that's not particularly difficult either. All right, how did it improve in the state of the art? The big problem we overcame was eliminating that density parameter epsilon by persisting over it. And that just allowed us to find the natural clusters that were present in your data. And that's great. Uh, and that's a nice, smooth way to get rid of any parameter you really don't like. You say, oh, I'll persist over it. And I'll look for the clusters or the blanks that are stable across the wide range of that unnatural parameter. Uh, on the other hand, we added a new parameter in, which was this minimum number of points to be considered a cluster, which is less good. On the bright side, this ends up serving as your primary resolution parameter. Most clustering algorithm is going to have to have one of these under the hood. And smallest number of points to be considered a cluster is a much more intuitive parameter for a real human to set than a epsilon distance in your space. And so that's a step in the right direction. We also got variable density clustering for free, which was a really nice perk. Uh, I've repeatedly stressed that clustering algorithms need to be scalable uh, before they start being solidly useful. Uh, that's true here as well. Here's a quick plot I stole from an old talk. It happens to cover all of the algorithms I've talked about in this talk. So it was an easy slide to steal. Uh, it shows that sort of DB scan and HDB scan live in this sort of middle region of your space. Uh, K-means are these two lines, two different implementations of it at the bottom. And you see really quickly why K-means is successful. Like that bottom line is almost flat up to 200,000 points. Um, like, yeah, it takes about constant time to run. You know, it's not quite, but it's darn fast and darn efficient on real data at really large sizes. This uh, salmon line ends up being uh, one of the hierarchical clustering algorithms, either single linkage or, or, uh, or complete linkage clustering. It's one of those two. And again, these are the fastest set of algorithms that you've got available for clustering. I have filtered off the whole mess load of the rest of the field of clustering algorithms because they live you know, up off my screen and sort of in my attic as opposed to on this particular plot. They do not scale particularly well, and they don't scale well up to even ranges of sort of 200,000 points. All right, how does it get used in practice? Uh, it's recent, more, much more recent, but still fairly popular as, as an algorithm, sort of 1600 uh, uses in the community. Gets used across a wide range of, of problems. It's astrophysics, uh, this one's biology, uh, forgery detection. It, it, like all over the place. It turns out that a whole lot of fields appreciate a fast clustering algorithm that's robust to noise and has really easy parameters to set. If you can build one of those and put it out there, everyone's going to end up using it. Super common. How does it fail? Well, I've got a new failing way, a new way to fail with this algorithm because we've added a new problem that we persisted over a parameter, which was great. And that let us find very natural clusters, which is great. But those natural clusters might not always be the resolution that a user is going to want. And so that makes this a really good algorithm to be the first algorithm you run on your data to find out what clusters occur with it naturally. But it might not be the last clustering algorithm you want to write on your data. You, you may want to do a whole pile of extra work to try to find the clusters you really care about. And so this is like if I was clustering documents, uh, the most natural clustering might be, oh, the set of documents that you know John looks at are in math and sports. You're like, right, but I, I want more resolution over here. I, I need more than the cluster of math. I need you know machine learning and, and data science and homotopy theory, and I need to break those apart. But you could keep the sports cluster here as, as a single uh, entity because I don't need it right now. And so your uses, usage of clustering algorithms can change. And uh, this natural clustering is a good first pass, but it won't always give you what a user actually wants. And that 
density problem in high dimensions still exists. And it's a really pesky problem because a lot of people in real world have very large high dimensional data sets. And so how are we gonna deal with that? All right, well, we're in the 2020s now. And so this is uh, pants no longer matter. We're in the age of isolation and virtual conferences. No one needs to wear pants. It, it, you can only see our upper torsos, it's fine. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna run dimension reduction before we run our HDB scan. I'm gonna suggest a technique uh, that we've recently developed called UMAP, which is uniform manifold approximation and projection. Uh, it's a particularly good pre-processing step for, for doing clustering, uh, topological style clustering uh, after doing dimension reduction. How does it work? All right, so first off, to find a note, we need to find a notion of density that makes sense. And so we're gonna presume that the data lives on a lower dimensional manifold. This is the intrinsic dimensionality of the data is lower than the ambient dimensionality that we're being presented with. This turns out to be a pretty reasonable assumption in a lot of real world cases. At its heart, UMAP is really just a topologically inspired manifold learning technique. We're gonna draw edges from each point to its set of nearest neighbors. We've seen that a couple of times in various talks throughout this week. It's a very reasonable way to sort of look at the structure of your data. Uh, we're going to reweight that graph in a particular way. Um, and then we're going to find a low dimensional representation of your data, which would have induced the same graph. All right, so there are a few things to keep in mind. It's a locality preserving technique. The data isn't naturally two, if the data isn't naturally two dimensional, like here's a point cloud of a mastodon squashed down into two dimensions. You can see we've preserved a lot of the local structure, which is great, but mastodons are three dimensional objects big ones. And so they don't flatten into two space without distorting in some way, shape or form. But the thing you see here is that we've sacrificed a lot of global distances to squash this down into to two dimensions and preserved a lot of the local distances. And I'm going to argue that clustering is largely dependent on that local structure. And so doing this to explore your data is great, but doing it for clustering is, is even better because that's the thing we really end up caring about. All right, uh, in order to do this, we're gonna make a couple of assumptions. Uh, we're gonna say your data is uniformly distributed under many manifold, uh, locally constant, locally connected. These are gonna give us sort of the graph representation that I talked about earlier. Rick often refers to this as the UMAP complex. Um, and then we're gonna find a low dimensional point cloud that induces a similar UMAP complex. And so two uh, metrics are similar if they induce the same UMAP complex. And here's similarity between those complexes is just being measured via cross entropy. Uh, I'm not going to give a detailed UMAP talk because we definitely don't have time for it. But if you're interested in more details, you can grab the original paper off archive. And Rick's done some really good work recently reformulating and cleaning up some of the underlying topological theory. And his slides and uh, prepent paper are linked off his webpage. And so they're definitely worth a click and a read. All right, how did it improve on the state of the art? Well, density didn't make sense in high dimensions. We've reduced the dimension. That's great. Now density makes a whole lot more sense. Uh, and we can talk about doing HDB scan and persistence in good ways. Now, the notion of dimension reduction followed by clustering isn't particularly new. Uh, I, I mentioned it earlier on this talk for the spectral clustering that I was talking about, which did sort of PCA and then k-means. And so I think the modern win here is that we're using manifold learning techniques to reduce the dimension instead of these linear matrix factorization techniques. So here's an example of why I think that's particularly useful. Um, here is the MNIST data set. I think it's come up in a couple of talks uh, briefly, and Colin was talking about it in one of the break sessions as well. And so this is a bunch of handwritten digits, a bunch of people did, and images of handwritten digits. And you say, oh, similarity between two digits, I just vectorize them and I look at the L1 distance between the individual cells, and I embed them down with either principal component analysis, which is just linear, a linear map into two dimensions, or UMAP. And you see very different things happening. Um, UMAP is preserving a lot of that local structure. I don't know if people can nod if you can read the numbers on the side. Yay, people can read the numbers on the side. That's awesome. 
And so you see the really nice things happening. So up in the top left, you get the, uh, the nines, the sevens and the fours, which if you think about it briefly in your head are very similar characters. Fours with a little bit of a curve look like a nine. Sevens, as you squish your nines loop, you start turning them into sevens. And so you can see some of this structure existing between them and the individual digits are, are being pulled out very naturally into their own separate uh, components. Whereas you see some global structure vaguely in the two-dimensional PCA, but because you're doing a linear map, you end up squashing this right on top of each other. You, you're trying to preserve the global distances for those PCA, and those global distances are swamping the local distances where your interesting structure and your interesting topology live. And so doing something sort of that, that captures the topology of your, your local data before doing clustering is a really nice and beneficial trick to make use of. This gets even harder when you generalize to uh, slightly more complex data. What if instead of handwritten digits, you, this is fashion MNIST, you had pictures of clothing. And so you've got bell bottoms, which are in trousers down sort of uh, here. No, this is t-shirts. You don't have trousers that are sitting down here. And, and it becomes more complex and you get more intermixing and it's harder to tell the images apart, but you're still seeing a lot of the structure being pulled out by your manifold technique that you are losing by doing those traditional linear embedding techniques. All right, so how does it actually get used in practice? Uh, UMAP has become very popular uh, quite recently. It's a 2018, it's got 23,000 uh, papers making use of it. UMAP and HTB scan are far less common and far more novel. This is something that academic literature is just starting to make use of. Uh, it's something we've been using internally for quite a long time now and have found it quite useful on quite a lot of real, real world data. Um, that said, it's still being used in a wide variety of fields. Here's uh, music recommender systems using the combination of UMAP and HTB scan. Uh, no example would be complete without COVID research. So here's an example of using UMAP and HTB scan on behavior of people uh, moving and the spread of COVID that way. Here's another one from cellular biology, analyzing the structures of the COVID vi virus. That's great. So we've, we've seen it's useful, it's used in practice. How does it fail? Well, we've still got that ugly problem that the natural clustering doesn't equal the desired cluster necessarily. Um, and we've got a second sort of a problem. This is where it's a little unsatisfactory. The, we glued together two sort of topologically inspired algorithms in a little bit of an ad hoc way. We do, we do uh, you know, a UMAP, we get an embedding, and then we induce another minimal spanning tree, and we do HTB scan across that. So that's less desirable from a theoretical and a practical perspective. Practically, it's expensive to do. Theoretically, it makes proving things uh, about the, the combination of the two algorithms much harder to deal with. And so it makes it harder to analyze. And so is there a theoretically grounded end-to-end solution? Um, that might be a nice way to do it. Can we do clustering naturally on the UMAP complex itself instead of doing UMAP and then sort of an HDB scan? All right, which leads us to, I'll wrap things up with what's next? Where can we go from here? So how can we use TDA to inform cl practical clustering problems is sort of the underlying thesis of this whole talk. You can see that a lot of the more successful clustering algorithms throughout history got rephrased really cleanly as very simple TDA notions. And, and that really implies something very strong about the idea of using topological data analysis to do uh, things in clustering and dimension reduction. And I, I think this is really just starting to be uh, looked at and people are starting to make use of this in practice, but it's a really rich and diverse way to go. Uh, remember that fixed value of K? What else can we do? Multi-persistent version of HTB scan. We said we held K fixed and persisted across epsilon. Well, that, that selection of K is an also an awkward parameter to set. It would be really nice to do sort of multi-dimensional persistence across both epsilon and K at the same time and find out this proper notion of natural clustering. And so Michael gave a really interesting talk previously. It would be really interesting to see if we could apply those kinds of results 
to at larger scales to this kind of a problem, that would be neat. Uh, better TDA solutions for high dimensional data, as I talked about earlier, a clean HDB style analog that worked naturally on the UMAP plot complex would be a really nice way to go. That would save you both the extra compute of embedding that UMAP complex in a low dimensional space and give you a cleaner and simpler and theoretically uh, sharper algorithm to work with. Last is that problem that sort of stuck around at the end, which is uh, the persistent and natural clustering isn't always the one that the user actually wants. Um, I've encountered this when I use it in practice on algorithms. I've seen lots of our users encounter the same problem. They will look at the clustering, they'll visualize it in 2D with a UMAP and they'll say, yeah, those are good clusters, but can you fragment that pile into two piles and can you merge those ones together? Because I've explored the data and the story I want to tell about the data groups these into a homogeneous pile. And that's hard to do without any extra information. And so how do you incorporate extra labels, or this is the thing called semi-supervised learning or active learning, from a user into your clustering algorithm to help guide either the resolution of the algorithm um, or to transform your underlying metric. And so there's a whole suite of uh, literature on something called metric learning, which is instead of unsupervised learning where God hands me a metric and I find you the clusters, this is to say, well, can, I'm allowing you to deform that metric in ways that make it more useful for a particular task. And so we've done some work in semi-supervised uh, dimension reduction and semi-supervised clustering that allows you to do those sort of games, which opens a whole can of worms in that as soon as you start playing those games, you're, uh, you're well outside of an unsupervised space and you can eat your own tail very easily. And you can start seeing structures and then tweaking your algorithm to reinforce the structures that you believe exist and, and chasing yourself round and around in a circle, uh, which can easily lead you to a good story that's not true. And so this, this is an area of, of analysis that you need to be very careful if you start uh, wandering down. But, or something else entirely. Um, new ideas in, in the space of useful clustering for you know topologically inspired useful clustering and image reduction are always welcome. Rick was talking earlier about, hey, what if we don't use uh, cross entry to measure the difference between the manifolds? Um, what games can we play? Are there other games that other people want to play? We are more than happy and welcome to ideas. I got the natural bias of I want those ideas to be practically useful on large amounts of data in real world with lots of noise. But that being said, ideas are fun and always welcome. All right, that wraps up my talk with sort of 10 minutes to chat and means I won't keep you past five o'clock because I know I'm running low on fuel at the end of the workshop, so I imagine other people might be as well. Any questions and or suggestions or ideas? Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, happy to take questions. <laughs> Benoit, oh, John, did you see the question in the audience? I did not, I, I sorry, I can't, I don't have any chat pop-ups that-, that... Uh, Benoit had his hand raised and gonna let him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey John, <laughs> so when you started talking about the combination of UMAP and HDB scan, you said you started from the assumption that all of your data lives on one joint manifold. Now, if you have some, some information about labels that might exist amongst your data set, could you um, inject that information by assuming that there are as many manifolds as there are labels, for instance, or could you think of some test uh, for you to, to determine whether your, your cloud of points lives on more than one manifold or on disjoint manifolds? So when I said manifold, I'm gonna use it in sort of the uh, dubious dictionary of data science definition. And so I'm allowing this thing to be cut into disjoint manifolds, which are, are really, we're talking about representing the data by this UMAP complex, which you can think of as, as a weighted graph. And that weighted graph doesn't necessarily need to be a single connected component. 
Uh, and in fact, it won't be a single connected component in many real world cases where you are approximating it with a K nearest neighbor graph. And so you can really think those, those, those components I threw down in the space in some cases might be completely disconnected, in which case they are sort of what you were thinking of as separate manifolds that I've laid down in, in some sort of joint space. We get a little bit of global structure out of that because uh, the initialization that we use with UMAP uh, is a spectral embedding. And the spectral embedding has that problem we noticed earlier, or the problem that uh, it, it emphasizes maximizing uh, global, getting your global distances correct. And so laying all of your points down with a, with a, uh, with that, with that uh, sorry, PCA ahead of time or SVD gives you some of your global structure on your manifold. And then we end up doing gradient descent to move the points around in order to better locally approximate the UMAP complex. Does that make, does that answer your question, Benoit? I was going to point out that the construction of the UMAP complex is really very flexible already because, you know, you can pick neighbors as you like, you can pick weights between neighbors as you like, and then go to town. So I, I think it's applicable to a whole bunch of different situations like what you're describing at the end. Yeah. Um, Joe, we got another question. I think his hand up was up first. Uh, hi, thank you so much. Uh, very nice talk. Um, super interesting. Now I really have to try some UMAP and so forth. Uh, I, I have, it's kind of, I guess it's more of a comment in that um, I suspect there is no one clustering approach for everything. Uh, and sort of, I'm such, like I'm, I, I did with audio. And so in my case, like hearing is one component and we know some of it, but we, do, we also don't know some of it. Yeah. And so one part where we do our K nearest neighbor radii and whatever is whenever we don't know anything. And then we just use that as a black hole, you know, Gauss was right kind of uh, thing, right? Uh, or we have a problem like musical genre classification. You actually had this example of music recommendation, right? Mm -hmm. Where if I ask two people on the street, like which genre is this song in? There's a very good chance to disagree. And the only way we even get to a ground truth for our training is asking lots of people and taking the mean. So we get rid of the fact that they actually disagree, right? So there's all sorts of stuff going on in real world data that's very specific to what you're actually doing there. And in some example, in astronomy, like it's physics, you just try to find the model. Right, but it's actually rigid, so you can you can assume all your manifold assumptions. So I think what 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 my comment is like, like the more methods, the better. And all I need to really understand is the interface, right? So as long as I know how I get into the UMAP, right. uh, I can do the preconditioning, and then I'm gonna use your clustering in my yeah. problem space, right? Yeah. The, so very nice work. I'm very excited to to play with UMAP now. Uh, the, the super fun game with with dimension reduction and clustering algorithms, all of these things is. And this is the hard bit. And this is the point where we leave as an exercise to the reader, right? That we have always sweep under the rug is the, what's the distance between your objects? So like we, you, in data science or statistics, we end up dealing with two problems, unsupervised learning or supervised learning. And the one case you have labels and someone tells you what they want the answer to be and you learn a way to, to figure it out. When you're in the unsupervised case, you have no labels. so you have to tell me what similarity means instead. And, and so a really fun, I mean, if you're doing music recommenders, a super fun game that ended up being very successful was similarity between two songs is the intersection of the set lists that humans had created that have those songs in common. So a song is the bag of playlists that contain it. <laughs> and then humans have naturally grouped these in these massive playlists on the internet. And it does a really good job of inducing a different distance measure than audio distance would be. And so again, it changes everything. Right, and basically you're just doing cluster matching, but they gave you a clustering, and now you try to match your cluster against that, right? <laughs> Absolutely, but I, I think that's all good, right? So it, this is just what you get into when you deal with real world problems is that they all have their idiosyncrasies. And for, like for me, for audio, I'm perfectly happy to do a lot of pre-processing with prior knowledge that I have yep. to then get into these clustering situations with 
whatever the notion of good data is, right? Because good data in that context means all the domain knowledge that I can provide, I have to sort of prepare yep. for some more generic um, uh, uh, approach. Yeah, and we often describe HDB scan as a good exploratory data analysis clustering tool, right? It's that good, hey, find me the natural clusters that live in my data. Like, oh, I'll have a look at it. No, that, that tells me something about the structure, tells me something about my distance measure, tells me something about what's going on in the space. You could think of k-means as serving a different purpose that is the super fast, bad partitioning of my data. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that could be useful. Like, there are proper cases where that's a really useful thing to do. I need a rough, I need you to roughly cut my data up into chunks. And so lots of different clustering algorithms. The key, I think, is sorting out what clustering algorithm is useful in what case and what dementia reduction algorithm is useful in what case and what sort of assumptions they have uh, that you're making implicitly when you apply them to your data. So maybe that leads to one more comment. I don't want to occupy, but I actually like parameters, right? If you do dimensionality reduction, I want you to be able to stop at a certain point. I know there's, you know, five speakers in this audio, right? I want you to stop at five because I want to pick up those five, right? So uh, parameters are not necessarily bad if, you know, they have some relationship to what you understand and are looking for. Um, so like right. completely unsupervised stuff to me, that just means, look, I don't know a model and I just try to find one in there. And so supervision is not bad per se, right? Anyway, I'm going to butt out because all yeah. I'm doing is commentating. I'm not uh, asking any it's questions. Okay. This is what we have workshop. I'm going to argue that intuitive parameters are good. Unintuitive parameters I dislike. I will punt off to Colin to- Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to stop you from answering more annoying questions <laughs> so we can ask other people to ask questions. Um, Peggy, um, go right ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. I recently read one of the clustering algorithm called uh, Tomato, topological mode analysis tool. It's also based on the idea of persistence. I would like to know the disadvantage of that other algorithm as compared to the human that you presented. So the algorithm was called, sorry, topological. Topological uh, mode tomato. analysis tool, Tomato. Tomato. I don't actually know it. Does anyone else on the call actually looked at the algorithm before? Yes, um, but I forget. <laughs> Leland? <laughs> like I did. I just, like I last week and I forgot. I haven't had time to look at it. Details of the algorithm off the top of my head. It has um, many similarities to HDB scan, but uh, veers in, in, in different directions. Uh, I in my limited experience with it, did not find it to be as effective on the data sets I was applying it to when I was playing with it, which is not to say that it isn't highly useful. In my cases, it was not, but that's, that's, that's all, I, all I can say about it. Unfortunately, I don't recall enough details about it to, to speak in detail about uh, the differences. Anyway, can you give us the, for the 30 second rundown of what the algorithm is actually doing? Yes, thank you. The algorithm is based on the idea of persistence. It's like combining a high climbing and a, how you call it, an hierarchical clustering. Okay. Uh, if you consider a function like this, you will be look at the extrema. The extrema are automatically set as cluster, but you need to set a parameter to, to decide whether uh, you would consider it as a cluster or not because they can you can have some noise. That means that it's, it's an extrema that doesn't last for a wide range of parameter. Hmm. Okay. I, I will. Where we can, someone wants to throw it in chat. That would probably be helpful. Yeah, if someone has the, a good paper on that, that would be a, a great link to throw in the chat. Yeah. Yes, I, I, uh, I will find the link and I will tap it on the chat. Okay. I appreciate that. Alex? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the interesting talk. Um, I was just going to ask um, if you go back to the the plot you had about runtimes of some of these clustering algorithms. Share screen again. Sorry. 
Sorry. There we go. That yeah, one. thanks. I was just so I didn't um, I didn't catch it when you were talking about it in real time. Um, the the pink uh, curve you said was some kind of hierarchical clustering. Did you say you it was maybe... either single linkage or ward? Uh, okay. <laughs> yes. So what I I mean, I was just wondering. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I was just like, I was gonna be surprised if single linkage performed that badly compared to HDB scan. Um, I would agree. I, uh, the, the shape of the curve, I suspected it was, made me suspicious that it was a ward clustering or an uh, average linkage clustering. There's any okay, because it wouldn't, I mean, like, tell me if I'm just missing something, but single linkage feels almost like a subroutine of HDB scan. Yes, you are not wrong. Okay. Uh, part of the trick is algorithmic tricks involved in implementation that uh, are not available in most implementations of single linkage clustering that you will find. Um, there are fast ways to do this. They are not commonly implemented because they're more complicated to write uh, efficiently, um, but they are in uh, most of the standard implementations of HDB scan by this point. Yeah, I mean, you'll also notice these are implementation comparisons as opposed to like anytime you see one of these plots, it's someone's code against someone else's code. Right. right? Um, and as, so, I mean, the green line here is actually HDB scan and the blue line is actually DB scan. So. Right, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an implementation artifact. Exactly. But, but I was just wondering, I mean, like, I guess, um, so it totally makes sense that some of these uh, optimizations that you guys came up with for HDB scan just aren't in the current implementations of single linkage. Um, I was just wondering if there's maybe something like more complicated that I'm not thinking of that actually means that somehow setting a K can somehow like speed something up somewhere. But that's, that's maybe not true, right? Um, no, that, that doesn't, that does, I don't think that works out to be true in this, in this particular case. Okay, thanks a lot. No, no problem.